Okay, so last time I got the setup working where I can render something into a small patch and look at it up close to see exactly how the pixels are behaving. And I was doing some experiments about pixel centers, but I didn't really get into trying to make something that looks good yet. And that's what I'm gonna get started with today. So first things first, I'm gonna set up a little test with one big feature that I was having problems with at the end of the last arc, which is thin vertical lines. And I'm not using the shader I had then, I'm just starting from scratch and trying to see what options exist for making that particular case look good. It might turn out as I integrate more and more features that whatever I come up with now is just gonna get thrown out the window because it might turn out that I really only want it to be rectangles and that rectangles that are thin turn out a little bit differently when they aren't special case to vertical lines. But we're going to kind of build up to it one step at a time. I at the very least want to see what's the best way I can make a vertical line look. And there's two cases I care about that are tricky. So the easy case that I don't care about so much is just having a vertical line of like one line of pixels. That's pretty easy to get. What is a little harder is a vertical line of pixels that is not perfectly aligned to the pixel grid and especially a vertical line of pixels that is animating over time and is sliding slowly so it's not animating and skipping between lots of pixels very quickly but instead it has to gradually move from one pixel to the next. If I do that with no anti-aliasing of any kind, it'll just sort of snap from pixel to pixel. And I wanna kind of be able to do that and make it look good. So I'm gonna start with setting up uh, a couple of test cases, some static lines that don't animate but are on different alignments with the pixel grid and one animating pixel line. Once I've got that test stuff up and running, we'll uh, come go on and look for ideas of what solutions there might be to this problem. Okay, so I have my test bed in there and we can clearly see that it's just busted. The pixels are snapping when the line is sliding around and the alignment between the offset pixels is all like out of order. It doesn't look like they're kind of equally spaced and it might not ever look like they're perfectly equally spaced or that the sliding pixels or sliding vertical line is perfectly sliding if you really look closely and watch, but it should be able to get a lot better than this. Now the question is, how do I want to do that? And I have a few ideas I could use to answer that. I could start exploring those ideas. But before I do that, I want to go and look around online and gather some ideas, see if anyone has any really solid solutions or anything like that. See if there are a couple different schools of thought or any good ideas of what not to spend time on, things like that. So I'm going to do a little research online and then figure out where to go from there. Okay, so I think there are two main paths I want to start off by exploring. The first one I'm going to do is multi-sample anti-aliasing. This is just a feature in OpenGL that I can enable and then I can see if it makes my lines look smoother or not. And I think that might not be the solution I want to land on. Multi-sampling does mean having to do some amount of extra compute and a lot more memory storage on the GPU, but it might be a good way to get an idea of what's possible. And maybe the effect that I get from that will be one I can recreate in a cheaper way once I understand sort of what it looks like when that's happening. It might also be that when I turn this on, it immediately proves to me that there are things that I can't get to work even with multi-sample anti-aliasing, and then I'll have to think about why that is. But I think either way, it'll help me generate ideas at the very least to try multi-sample anti-aliasing. 
The other thing I want to try is just writing a shader that manually computes the coverage amount up for a pixel and then sort of fudging the geometry or expanding the geometry. So when I'm placing a, a line that's supposed to be a width of one, I might need to end up expanding that so that I, as we've established already, if I'm actually placing geometry, you know, at sub pixel alignments, there's some ambiguity in the spec. There's no guarantee about which pixels get touched. And for things like single pixel wide lines that I'm trying to align with some other graphics, like if I'm trying to lay out a UI that uses single wide pix uh, lines to denote like the spacing between concepts on a timeline, for instance, which is where this originally uh, showed up. I don't really want to have imprecision there. I don't want to have sometimes it's all shifted by a pixel at, because of the tricks I'm using. I want to be in a lot more control than that. So I might want to avoid having my actual geometry get aligned to subpixels and instead use the shader to compute the offsets. That way I can get a lot more precise about which pixels get which amount of coverage instead of leaving it up to OpenGL or the multi-sampling or something. So those are the two paths I'm gonna try. We're gonna start with multi-sampling and so I'm gonna get started with uh, the things I need to do to implement that. In order to use multi-sampling, I need to set up a few new OpenGL features. Some of these I've actually already grabbed the definitions for in sessions that I did not record for the procedural art and animation videos I did. So the things I do need that are new are some constants and things that are sitting over in the core ARB reference file that I have. So I'm going to move those things over. In particular, I need to set up a multi-sample texture and I need to set up a frame buffer that has that multi-sample texture attached. I could also just set up the Windows buffer itself to be multi-sample, but that's a little bit more of a pain. That means going to the wiggle layer and having it give me a multi-sample window. And it'll be harder to switch back and forth between those two things. It's a little easier to render to an off-screen multi-sample buffer and then resolve down to the flat non-multi-sampled window at the end of the multi-sampled rendering step. As usual, this isn't a full tutorial on how OpenGL features that are more advanced work, but a quick overview of how a frame buffer works or how to think about it is that it's just the collection of information you need to set a output tar context, right? So if you're gonna render something to a window, you usually have colors and you have sometimes depth or other things that you are using to store up information about what you're rendering. And a frame buffer is just a handle on which you can collect up all of those concepts so that you can render to something other than the window. The calls relevant to setting up all of this are GL text image 2D multi-sample, which creates the special kind of texture that I need. GL gen frame buffers, which is how you create a new frame buffer object handle. GL bind frame buffer, which selects it into the OpenGL context. And GL frame buffer texture, which is how I set the texture I've already created as the color attachment to the frame buffer I've created. And then finally, I want to set the bind of the frame buffer again so that I'm actually rendering to the window and not to my frame buffer. Next up, I'm going to do some work to make sure that the frame buffers are being created correctly and then start putting them to use by rendering to them.
once I've rendered to a multi-sample frame buffer, I have a texture that isn't in a normal format and it's not on the window. So what I have to do is called resolving it. I have to resolve the multi-sample texture onto a flat texture. And the flat texture I'm gonna resolve it to is gonna to happen to also be the window. And so to do that, I need this called glblit frame buffer. Here I'm getting a bug, so I have to go and do a little bit of debugging. Uh, I end up just spamming the GL get error and asserting that that is zero until I find the spot where it's not zero. Uh, ideally, I could debug a little more effectively than that using the callback, but I don't think I have that set up, so I'm just spamming this around near all the sort of chunks where I do some GL work to see if I can narrow down where the error is first appearing. And once I do that, it becomes pretty obvious that the mistake is that after I set the read frame buffer, uh, to the multi-sample frame buffer, I need to set it back. So at the end of this thing where I first target the multi-sample frame buffer and then re resolve it, I then need to select back to fully reading and drawing from the normal frame buffer because when I do the geo read pixels a little bit later, that's going to read from whatever is currently the selected read frame buffer. And so I can't just get away with leaving the read frame buffer bound to the multi-sample uh, frame buffer anymore. I need to go back to being the window. Finally, I've got this idea working, and so I spent a little time playing with it, toying with the number of samples that I put in the multi-sample texture, and also the width of the geometry that I have for a line, and I start to get some ideas about what's going to work and what's not. There, There's a few reasons why I don't think this is the final place I want to stop. I definitely want to run at least the second experiment that I proposed earlier, which was to not use a multi-sample texture, but to just resolve this in the shader myself. Uh, you know, sort of calculate the coverage of a pixel from the the position of a segment and see if I can make that look good. And I think that that might be better because right now this has kind of got a big limitation, which is that with multi-sampling, the shades of gray you can get are sort of controlled by how many samples you put in. If I want to be able to get really smooth transitions from dark to bright, I need lots of samples. And right now, you know, I'm putting in eight, which looks okay, or 16, which looks okay. But that's a lot, like a lot of limitation. And the way I sort of the bottle that ties together something that costs quite a lot, which is increasing the samples with the fidelity in a way that doesn't seem ideal to me. I think we get a lot more precision for a lot cheaper by just hand calculating it. So I think that's going to be worth it to experiment. But I am starting to formulate some ideas, which I'll share with you after we've done the second experiment that I planned, which was what we'll cover in the next video. So I'll see you then.